Uh, welcome to this uh, first panel discussion on uh, uh, the um, changing demographics and health status in global cities. Uh, we have uh, three panelists, uh, but uh, Professor Yuan Ren uh, cannot come. So we now have uh, two distinguished panelists, Professor Paul Yip and uh, Dr. Michael Guasmano. Uh, uh, as you know, Professor Paul Yip is uh, a professor at the Hong Kong University. He's director of the Center for Suicide Research and Prevention. He's, the, he's a professor in the Department of Social Work and Social Administration of the uh, Hong Kong University. And uh, I think Professor uh, Yip is well known to all our um, local colleagues, uh, but for our international uh, visitors, uh, Professor Yip has done uh, a lot of work in, in suicide and has been widely acclaimed uh, both internationally and locally for his work in, in suicide given uh, awards by uh, Distinguished Alumni Award by La Troupe University for its excellent research and service on population health in Asia. Uh, he's also been uh, awarded, uh, 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 recognized for his work in China, and he's also Vice President of International Association of Suicide Prevention. Um, he's also been uh, a recipient of Outstanding Supervising Research of the University of Hong Kong, and the Silver Asian Innovation Award by the Asian Wall Street Journal in and Singapore Economic Development Board. So his research interests are the, is the public health approach uh, for suicide prevention. Uh, you're familiar with Dr. Uh, Wasomo's uh, research interests in comparative health systems uh, with a focus on aging population in global cities. He's widely published, and I think you've heard some of his research work. He's now a, a research scholar at the Hastings Center uh, he, he was um, uh, started off as a, in, a, a, with a PhD in political science from the University of Maryland. And uh, he's, he's now, as you heard from the uh, uh, moderator, he's now uh, chairman, the current president of the Committee on Aging and Politics in the American Political Science Association. Uh, so we have uh, two very distinguished speakers, and I think they'll be speaking for about 15 minutes each. Uh, covering, uh, I think Dr. Guasumo will cover some of the, make some comments about Shanghai as well, because we're talking about uh, US, Hong Kong, and Shanghai. So could I uh, invite uh, Professor Paul Lee to start? Good morning. Uh, thank you, Michael, for the invitation, and thank you, GK, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm coming here to share with you some of the uh, update uh, situation in Hong Kong about our population dynamics, and also would like to um, share some of our experiences, I think, in um, how to make Hong Kong to be a sustainable, uh, how, to, how can we achieve to have a sustainable population? One that is our past, 80s, 90s, well, I think, uh, by and then, and that is the present, right? That is the population pyramids. I think you can see that is the um, male, that is the female, and then the purple color. It, this is our domestic help in Hong Kong, which account for about 300,000 people. But what does the future hold? The future, and that is what it's supposed to hold. I mean, what it means that if a present situation with the present birth and then death and the migration pattern, and that is what it's going to look like. May I know what does it look like? It doesn't look like a pyramid, doesn't it? It, it looks like tomatoes, right? just like tomatoes when they pass through and what will happen. Everything when the tomato goes through and then that will have destruction. So what I think what we're, what we're trying to say that if a present situation, that if a population uh, are, are, are according to the present trajectory, I think that is what we can do happen. Now, if you don't see it in this way, what we're looking at in this way, it's like a tsunami, right? I think that is in 201. I think that's what's going to happen. The big wave is coming. Uh, this big wave is coming from the baby boomers, right? Those who were born in the 50s and 60s. When you look at 2050, the 13, I think that is where we are now. So in 2026, and then that's what's going to happen, and then 2041, and then we've all been wiped out. I mean, we've all been wiped out, what it means that if at the present situation, if we do not have a more healthy population distribution, and that would not be conducive for further development. 
Now, what happened to our population size? I think in Hong Kong, I think we enjoy to have a high population growth, I think in the 80s, 90s, and even up to the year 2000s. But when we go to the, the, in the next 20 or 30 years, I think we experience about less than 1% of growth. Now, when we have a less 1% of growth, what it means that I think we have less population and we have more older adults. Now, uh, what Michael has been saying, I think in Hong Kong, it only takes 20 years to double our elderly population. In France, I think it takes 100 years, I think, for them to double their, their elderly population. What it means is that we have less time to do the preparation. So what we are anticipating, we have about 2021, I think we're about 19%. At present, we have about 14.5% of the, our population age 65. Now by 2041, if nothing changed, and then what we are t talking about is nearly one third of our people at age 65 or above. Now that is our age structure, and then that is our median age. So what we're talking about now when we go out, I think there are, 40, there are half of the people that age 45 or, or above. And then that is the situation. Now we also, what we see, we also see the change of the population structure as well. So we see this as a size of the population from 3.4, 3.1, 2.9, and now it's going to 2.8. But now we always say it's the 2.8 plus a cat or plus a dogs. So I think that is where I was staying. I think we see that is the uh, Western couples, they have two children, and then the Chinese couple, and then they have two dogs. No, I think that's it. And when I was in, G in UK uh, just a couple of months ago, and I found out they can have kids, and then they can have dogs together. You know? so, I, so I think that is something that we have to ask oh, uh, Hong Kong, why our family somehow, sometime, we have to make this competing choice. I mean, either you raise a family, I think, or you have a pet. No. Now, that is the total fertility rate. I mean, the total fertility rate, it represents, it's just the average number of the baby born of women during the life cycle. I think we are coming from, I think, three point something, and now it's going down to one. Now, more interestingly, when we look at, do the comparison between yeast and West, now, it seems that in the West, they, they are well around here from 1.6, 1.7, and up to 2. But for all the high-income country in Asia, it seems that I think we are bouncing around about 1.2 and 1.3. Now, it seems that there is a gap. There's a gap that the Asian cannot cross over, cannot break through. I think there's something we have to ask about. How come, I think, in the old Asian China, we have a lot of babies, we have a lot of brothers and sisters, but how come, I think, once it goes to the 80s and the 90s, it seems that we are right state here. Well, what we, one of the explanation uh, it is that we have a very substantial reduction of the fertility rate, and especially for those groups, age 25 to 30, and although there's a bit of catch up, I think in the, uh, at the later age of 35 to 40, but the impact of this catch up itself is very small. Each year, we only have about two or 3,000 people, and out of the 50,000 of birth. So the impact itself, I think, to, towards the overall total fertility is very limited. Okay? So what we see, what we see is not a temporary effect. I think the temporary effect is being transient. I think what we are seeing is a quantum. It's a quantum job. So what we are talking about, aging is nothing new. Every country age, every global city age. But what we are talking about is the magnitude and the speed of aging. I think that is the Hong Kong is not well prepared. Uh, when we look at the, the main factor, we talk about marriage postponement, we talk about the increase of number of they did not get married, the postponement of the low uh, order life birth, and also the curtailment of the high order life birth. Now, when you look, compare of the people who remain single, I think in the, in the, in the 1981, there's nearly 70% of the women of this age, they got married already. But I think by 2011, I think from 70%, it's really go down to 27%. And also because in Hong Kong, I think the birth of out the birth of, out of the marriage is not that common as it, in a Western country. And actually, it is one of the major factors, I think, that affect the fertility situation in Asia. 
So uh, that is our situation. It doesn't uh, look very good because when we uh, look at not only the aging itself because of the total number of people participating in the workforce, it also has coming down too. So we are talking about from uh, now it's 55% and now it's going to go down to less than 50%. What it means that in a population, there will be more people not in the workforce than the people who are actually in the workforce. So you, so you can see that there's a possible economic bur uh, the burden imposed to the government. And actually, so why the Hong Kong government is so worried about it? Because uh, I'm one of the members of the population policy group, and what we get, uh, in, our, in our forecast, by 2018, I think our population, the working population, start to come down, but our actual total population size is still going up. So if the population size is going, uh, is coming down, but the population size is going up, then you can see that's just the challenge. Well, of course, we can see the divorce rate, and one of the good things in Hong Kong, I think we have the divorce rate, but we also, the, the, the remarriage rate, it has gone up too. So, so I think the people have not given up the marriage uh, aspiration yet, no. So now in Hong Kong, I think among uh, all the registered marriage, one in three, and they, either one or both of them, they are the remarriage situation. And the life expectancy, as we say, I think now we enjoy about 86% for female and 81% for male now. And now when we look at the demographic window, the window is Thinking about the ratio of the people who are aged uh, um, between 15 to 64 as a denominator and then less than 15, greater than 64 as the numerator. And then actually by 2012, it actually we have the golden period. I think that is the time that we have the lowest dependency ratio. That's why we can save some of the resources and then put in the investment. Now what happened why Hong Kong, I mean when we're facing this aging problem, uh, do not see the urgency of the problem because our overall dependency rate is still coming down. So the government they did not see the pain yet. But now, because now we are right at the bottom now, it's going to go up and it's going to go up very fast. And then, so I think, well, it's late better than never. So hopefully, I think by now, I think we can, I think, roll up our sleeve and really try to do something. Um, the other thing is it's not only the aging part, it is about the economic part. I think in Hong Kong, I think what we have seen, we have a huge income disparity in Hong Kong now. I think our Gini coefficient is about 0.537, which is very, very bad, I think. Um, and also when you can see, the, in the past decade, our income growth itself, it's just much less than in the 90s. And then when you look at the median, um, the monthly household income, I think in the early 90s, we we're coming from 10,000, it's go up to 18,000. But in the past 10 years, I think we only go up by nearly only 10%. So actually, now I can, you can start to appreciate why some of the people, they feel frustrated. Um, and also what we have done, we look at the income disparity, although as you might know, for the visitor as well, Hong Kong is a very small place with only 1,000 square kilometers. But we actually, within Hong Kong itself, there is the income disparity. And this income disparity itself, I think it's related to the health disparity as well. When we look at the premature mortality, I think when we look at the western side or the west, northwestern side of Hong Kong, I think this group of pe people, and actually, I think their health disparity is doing worse, I think, than the average. And also, for there are some uh, so called the uh, the inner urban area as well, in Sam Sui Po and then in, uh, in Sai Kong, and then this area, they also display some income disparity. Now, this income disparity in our study, it also does, it is related to the poverty as well. So the poverty itself, and it actually is related to the health performances. In our study, it, it, it has shown that I think there are seven areas which uh, they have more poor people, I think, than the average. And actually, each region, I think, the poverty is that it's being characterized by a different structure. Let me give you one example. For example, in the northwestern part, we are talking about why they are poor because they are more single parents, and then there are more children, the new arrival, and the unemployment rate. But when we're looking at the inner suburb area, I think we are talking about elderly. We are talking about the public housing. When we look at the health disparity, why we like to do the spatial analysis, what we like to do is, is to 
provide some informed decision and such if we try to do any policy, I think towards this and then try to make it more district specific and make it more focused and hopefully and more effective. And also the worst thing what we have seen, we look looking at the poverty and then we look at the resource map too and then to see any mismatch. And what we have found out that those so-called so poor area, they're also being more deprived from these public facilities. Now, for example, so I think when we talk about the Lofton district as well, we are talking about the food retail, the health services, the health services, the transport. So I think in order to improve the health performance, sometimes I think this sort of so-called the, the more deprived or more, uh, more vulnerable district it is something that we, we have to look at now because uh, uh, when we look at the suicide map as well, I think what we have found out that I think the, 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 the bottom 20%, the actual the risk to have suicide is about 1.5 times higher than the bottom 20%. And this, uh, this ratio itself is more probably found among the middle age group. So what we like to see now, now we have created a map, and then we have the income disparity, we have the aging, and then there are some strategic issues that we have to deal with. I think what we think is we need to have a high quality population and campaign the sustainable development. We, we believe that education and skill training is very important, and also we believe that the physical and well, the mental well-being should be uh, pay more, much more attention to. I think, as you know, I mean, when we're getting older, we have more high disability, and then when we're dealing with this, that is a challenge. And then you cannot expect the public uh, system can look after you. The only thing what you can do, you really have, can need to look after yourself. When you look at the life expectancy as well, when by 2016, I think we're still talking about, I think 20 years, I think for men, 25 years for female. And one thing what we are asking for now, we are living longer now, are we living healthier, right? Do we stay in the hospital shorter? I think now, based on the hospital authority data, now we're receding the turning around now. It's even how much they reduce the duration of stay of the people who stay in the hospital, but because of the tsunami, because of the older people come in now. So if we will wipe out all the potential benefit you could save by reducing the number who stay in the hospital, but because it's just the number is so big that we are not that well prepared for. So that is the age structure we are talking about, that is the going up, so and, and then the, for the age 65 or above, and it comes up, and then the rate of, of increase is much more then the possible expenditure increase to spend on the healthcare in the past 10 or 30, in the next 10 or 20 years. So stay behind the yellow line, you know I mean? Please keep yourself well. So we are talking about this, there's a double hit. The hit is the number itself, and also if they're not, if, if they're not healthier. So they will, the preference rate, and then the population size as well. Skill and training are very important. Uh, um, we are talking about extension of the retirement age of Hong Kong. I think that is that when we look at the only 60 years old, and that is our window, and if we manage to extend um, our retirement age to 65, you actually you have much more years to prepare, I think, for the aging. So, um, one thing I'd like to say something about the skill training and the productivity. I think that is in Hong Kong, we do like to, uh, uh, to increase the mobility of our young people. And, but these people, I mean, they do earn a very, very, very slow salary. And, and, and I, when I was in London and I saw this young man, they're as young as this guy, and he has, he can have a family, he can have a house, he can have a car, and, but he's still preparing the lunch for us. Of course, that lunch costs a bit more. But what I'm trying to say that I think we have to really provide the opportunity for young people and such that they really can move up this social ladder. I think if we can always stuck it at that level, I think that is the challenges we have. The migration, uh, I think what we believe that, I think there's a lot of complaint about the uh, migration from mainland China, but in our data analysis, it showed that without the migration from China, I think our population structure, it will be even more challenging. I think our population structure, it will look like this. Well, that will be even looks not very healthy, and that tsunami situation, it will happen 20 years ago. 
rather than now. So I think we do, our population has been benefited from the migration, and I, I think promoting the family working environment is very, very, very important. It's not an individual choice now. I think because the collective action, I think are uh, appearing to the government intervention, we do need a community response, I think, to deal with the situation. We do need the government NGO involved the community support project. I think that is in Japan, when I was in Japan, and, and to talk about active agents regular body check out and having green tea spa and then that would be good for them. And then um, the community based in participation and involvement is really important. We cannot simply rely on the medical and health services and how can we bring the resource out from the community for the community. I think that is the way to go. May I end up? I think that is I like to finish off. I mean that is the water and then there's a fire uh, um, um, and the whole idea is just when you try to use more water and then you still cannot put up the fire i think i still just shows this map to uk when he was the secretary um so we still can solve the problem uh, so i think we need to we need to think out of the box and then try to move the whole population so what we believe that if the, our overall population will be improved the people who need the services will be less and then uh, for a good population policy, it's very really important for Hong Kong and for the Asian country. I would say that in Hong Kong, there's a lot of politics. The politics is like the second arm. It moves very fast, but it doesn't change much. I think for the, for the economic situation, it's like, a, it's like the mini arm, it still moves, but we still have to do something. But if we do not have a good population policy, it's just like we miss the boat. I mean, once we sleep and when we get up, I think our plan is gone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Very interesting presentation. You have uh, Dr. Michael Gostromano. Thank you very much. Good to be back at the podium again. It's been so long. Um, so I'm just going to make a, a few remarks. Uh, most of my remarks are actually going to be quite supportive of, of what Paul Yip mentioned to you, but I do want to challenge or at least raise some caution about the use of some of the language. And in particular, one of the things I wanted to raise was the, the, the metaphor of the tsunami uh, or the tornado, which I hadn't heard before. I like the tornado as well. Um, nested within a lot of the language we use and some of the data we present about population aging are, are sort of normative claims kind of hidden within. Um, and the image of the tsunamis are rarely viewed uh, in positive terms for understandable uh, reasons. Um, and Population aging is due to a combination of factors, and, and, and Paul articulated these very nicely, right? It is always, a, a, throughout the world, a combination of low birth rates and also extension uh, at the end of life, uh, and very much driven by low birth rates in many places. Um, these are both positive and negative things, uh, and how our interpretation uh, not only of the factors that led to population aging, but the consequences and how we deal with them, um, we can't derive just by looking at the data. The data are useful for understanding where we are and how we got there, uh, but the meaning of those numbers uh, changes quite a bit. So for example, uh, low birth rates around the world historically have usually been tied to expanding economic educational and other opportunities for women. Uh, this has been an extraordinarily positive development that we wouldn't want to reverse. However, Paul also points out, particularly in the context of Hong Kong, uh, low birth rates may be driven in part by opportunities. And so desires to have more children are thwarted by limited housing or limited economic opportunity. And so what we make of those factors and why birth rates are low matter a great deal to our conversation about the ethics of population aging. Uh, similarly, uh, Many people have uh, now invoked uh, uh, my dear colleague Dan Callahan, the co-founder of the Hastings Center, in his infamous call for age rationing uh, of health care. Uh, but of course, Dan would certainly uh, argue, in fact, he has argued, that some of the reasons for this change in demographics are due to the enormous investments we've made in health care in extending life. He raises 
questions about whether that ought to be the goal of a healthcare system. And as I mentioned in the previous session, I think when thinking about these numbers, when these changes in demographics, particularly the rapid changes in demographics uh, in this region of the world, it's important to rethink the goals of a healthcare system. What is it we're trying to achieve? Uh, in many ways, uh, some of the things that have been achieved by healthcare systems in helping to extend life ought to be celebrated. Uh, Victor Rodwin, when presenting his data on life expectancy, said there's, there's no single greater measure uh, that you can think of in terms of health outcomes. People tend to want to live uh, a long time uh, and don't actually view this as a tragedy when they don't. Uh, on the other hand, the Dan has raised important questions, I think, about whether the continual expansion uh, of life ought to be the goal. Um, here, this, I, my slides aren't nearly as nice as Paul's. I apologize. He, he's, he's always better at this. But um, I, I've, these are just some, some profiles to show and to reinforce the point that this phenomenon of population aging, uh, this expanding global waistline, if you will, uh, not quite up to his tornado, uh, is, is something shared by global cities around the world. Uh, and so that's the similarity. We have increasingly uh, so older populations, larger and larger larger uh, percentages of the population, 65 and over, and even in many global cities, um, populations 85 and over, which are the most rapidly uh, expanding uh, segment of the population. However, the point I would like to make here is that it's, it's important to recognize from a policy point of view, from a planning point of view, that demography is never destiny. And I think this is, Paul got to this in some of his comments as well, because it's not just what's happening with demography, but how are we responding to it? And how can we sensibly think about changing the sorts of social and health policies that we need to have in place in order to accommodate the changing needs of an aging population. Um, one thing I do want to comment on is the old age dependency ratio, which, which Paul talked a little bit about. The changing percentage of people uh, who are in the workforce, usually to 16 to 64, um, it's calculated in different ways in different places, and then the old age uh, percentage of the population 65 and above. One of the things that's useful to note is that in many parts of the world, uh, it's really a bit misleading only to look at old age dependency ratios, and much more useful to look at total dependency ratios. And even there, by the way, those numbers can be misleading. Total dependency ratios essentially change what you put in the numerator. It's not just the percentage of older people, but also the percentage of younger people who presumably are out of the workforce. And because of declines, in birth rates, the total dependency ratio in most of these cities that I have on this screen actually remained relatively flat. And it turns out children cost us a lot of money as well as older people, and they've not yet contributed a thing to our economies, and so it's a bit strange to think that we can't afford, we want to be careful with language again. Um, in the United States, we often talk about uh, the fact that our healthcare spending is unaffordable or my favorite, which is that it's been unsustainable. Richard Nixon in 1969 discovered that we had a healthcare crisis in the US, a healthcare spending crisis, and they declared that it was unsustainable. So we have had unsustainable healthcare spending for 40 years. So I invite you to reflect on that. Um, it's an interesting use of the English language. Uh, this really gets to what are our priorities and what should our investments be. Again, I'm very sensitive to what Alistair Campbell said before about uh, investing in inefficient systems. He's absolutely right. And so spending resources unwisely doesn't make any sense and indeed, I would argue, is unethical. But we do want to be careful about sort of leaping from the is to the ought and thinking about uh, what these systems are and what they actually mean. The other uh, point that Paul made that I wanted to comment on as well is the issue about the so-called demographic window. And indeed, Hong Kong is facing this wonderful demographic window that uh, economists and demographers like to talk about, where you have a sort of fairly low dependency rate. And people will point to countries like Japan, for example, that experienced tremendous economic growth at a time when they had relatively small 
older populations, relatively small, younger populations, and the sort of uh, sort of great expansion of the working age population because it is an economic opportunity. What people often sort of ignore when talking about the demographic window is the situation in much of South America at about the same time when Japan was exploding. The demographic profile in much of South America looked almost identical. Uh, to the parts of Asia that were just experiencing this so-called wonderful demographic window. But they didn't prosper. Their economies didn't grow, primarily due to corruption and the fact that people who had money and wanted to invest it did not particularly want to invest it in places where they thought their money might not be very well protected. So again, this is just another example where the demographic facts don't necessarily lead you in a particular direction. There are lots of choices that need to be made um, and thought about. And to bring this back to health care, uh, my presumed uh, area of expertise, I wanted to mention some findings that, that Victor Rodwin mentioned earlier. This is from a project that I had the privilege to do with uh, Jean Wu and Patsy Chow, uh, and also with, with Victor and Dan Weiss, looking again at avoidable hospital conditions uh, and then contrasted with something called marker conditions. Uh, and I'll explain these in just a moment. These are hospitalizations for things that, at least in theory, can be managed on an outpatient basis. They include bacterial pneumonia, congestive heart failure, uh, and a variety of other conditions. Uh, and what you see here is really quite striking. We had been using uh, this indicator to look at health systems and other global cities for a number of years when we started looking at gene. And we contrasted them with what are called marker conditions. Our colleague John Billings from New York University developed this concept. And these are hospitalizations for things like heart attacks and hip fractures. These are hospitalizations that are not only uh, unavoidable, but, but, they are, are, um, but they are not really directly related to primary care. You can have a wonderful primary care medical home and a good relationship with your doctor, an electronic medical record, all of the things that the WHO think make up a wonderful healthcare system and still fall and break your hip. Uh, and so this has nothing to do with primary care. Um, so one of the ways we use this contrast is to say in places that have higher rates of marker conditions, perhaps that the rates of avoidable hospitalizations are just driven by the overall health of the population. They have nothing to do with access to primary care. But what we tend to find is that there's no correlation between rates of marker conditions and avoidable hospitalizations, kind of reinforcing the idea that primary care systems seem to drive this. The other really striking part, as you probably already noticed from this graph, is that particularly among men, rates of avoidable hospitalization, these data are a bit old, but rates of hospitalization in Hong Kong were as high, if not higher, than in the other global cities. Now, this is troubling in and of itself, uh, but what's really important to recognize is that the prevalence of most of the diseases that are reflected in avoidable hospitalizations are significantly lower in Hong Kong. Again. Not surprising, this is a hospital-centric system. Uh, and it's a wonderful hospital system in many ways. But one of the choices that Hong Kong faces as its population ages in a quite rapid manner is what sort of health system should we provide? Because of course, treating the kinds of conditions that can be treated on an outpatient basis, on an inpatient basis, is extraordinarily expensive. And spending that money Again, back to my point about perhaps spending 20% of GDP isn't such a bad thing, but spending that money unnecessarily that could be spent on other things, investing those resources that could be used to, for example, to address the long-term care issues, better end-of-life care, better housing uh, for younger people is a problem, and it is an ethical challenge and an ethical question that the society needs to confront. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. I, I think the, we'll open the floor for any comments and discussion. I suggest that we may want to structure it in, in different ways. Because first, I think we're covering the whole issue about the challenges of uh, the demographic changes and the health status. That's one issue. The other would be posing uh, challenges that are quite separate from a problem. 
uh, the, I think the issue being that if it's challenged, just mean it's a problem. I think certainly I don't think aging is a problem. Uh, so aging is a challenge. It's a question of how we deal with it. And the problem is very often, as we say in, 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 in management and in, in policy, is how do you find a problem? Uh, you, when you look at the solution, when, when you target it as a problem, your solution is going to be very different. So perhaps you could look in that context in terms of the challenges of aging and health status, uh, whether we think it's a problem or whether it's uh, how th that challenge is going to be dealt with, how do we frame it? Then what are the uh, responses, as uh, Michael is suggesting, the policies that might be appropriate, and then the ethical dimensions of this. So, so I think there's a whole series of things that we could discuss. Um, I think Paul had, has already given some ideas in terms of what are the likely response to the aging, the uh, retirement, uh, you, you, you get people to work longer, uh, better health. Uh, and I think Michael also talked about the dependency ratio, which I've always had a problem with. Uh, because people are 65 doesn't mean they're dependent. Uh, we, we're equating that because the, the compression of mobility uh, is something that we're observing. People are now more, much more healthy when you, when you have people living to 80, 90, and 100. When you're people in the 80s, they're still going to the gym. Uh, so what, what is this dependency? Is, is that the real problem? Uh, the, the responses are probably the problems rather than the problems of aging. So I, I throw it out for you for, for your comments and discussion and questions. Yes, uh, Professor. Sorry, I just, I just wanted to ask uh, you and Paul Yip whether you both still subscribe to the compression of mobility thesis because there's been some other studies which, which uh, cast some doubt about that and I'm at a loss as to how to interpret them. And I don't follow that literature so I would value your thoughts on that. I, I tend to subscribe to what you said, the compression of morbidity. Uh, older people are in better health today than they used to be. But I understand there are other, uh, Eileen Criven I believe, uh, and others who have some shown who, who have other interpretations with new data. So I would like your views on that if you if you followed that literature. Um, there are certain survey and then to look at the uh, physical and mental health situation of, of Hong Kong. And then we have looked at the data uh, supplied by the hospital authority uh, by looking at the total hospitalization days, right? It actually, I think for the past decade itself, it is coming down. It's only the last couple of years it started to go up. I think uh, when they start to come down, uh, I think there are three factors that affect the hospitalization day. One is the number of people who get ill. Is two is the number of uh, times in each year they go to visit the hospital, and three, and how long they stay there each time, right? Now, what we have seen in Hong Kong, we have seen a very substantial and significant reduction of the duration of stay of the hospital. It might not due to the health, uh, health problem, it is just because of better management uh, of the HA system. And then but the people who actually who fall sick itself, it is, it doesn't, uh, it actually, it, it doesn't change much. So I think uh, when you look at the hospitalization day as a proxy, I think to represent the health situation of, uh, of the elderly, I think from our data we have, it seems that um, uh, we are living longer, but because we are living longer, we have more exposure. I think we generate more needs, but per person itself, it actually, they are getting better. Uh, Louis Xi, uh, I'm the president of the Hong Kong Medical Association. And uh, every time I hear overseas experts, you know, pointing out the uh, inadequacy of our healthcare system, I feel quite frustrated because over the last 20 years, we have uh, quite a number of uh, consultancy reports pointing out that the, uh, the health system is not the right way to go. 90% uh, of public funded uh, services goes to the hospital care and uh, close to 90% of primary care will be in the private market. And uh, this morning, you know, uh, the, uh, our speaker here asked, from overseas asked, why? Why is that the case? That when we have all these reports 
pointing out that the major problem in our healthcare system is what uh, Bill Shaw of the Harvard Report pointed out is compartmentalization. You know, private, primary care, public, secondary and tertiary care. So I, I, I came to the reason, the conclusion this morning is because I think largely because of the healthcare decision maker in Hong Kong are specialists. <laughs> Hospital base, all our previous secretary, including the EK, you know, York Chow and Ko Wingman, they're specialists. They belong to the hospital. And the whole system, healthcare system in Hong Kong is hospital based. And it has largely become an interest group. <laughs> Even though they are salary based. You know, they're serving the self interest of promoting specialist care. And as a, what we can see, in, uh, today we're talking about aging. And in Hong Kong, it's a really uh, alarming situation. People living in uh, elderly homes, whenever they have a slight fever or something, you know where they go? Not to a family doctor. They call the ambulance, you know, and send them to the emergency room. And when all these elderly home patients, when they have to follow up a specialist, of course, human for when they can be managed by their family doctor, they're still under the looking after by specialist clinic in the hospital authority. And you know what they do? The elderly person need someone to take this elderly person to the specialist clinic and wait the whole morning and sometimes the whole afternoon. And even it's a waste of manpower when when doctors, you know, community doctors can actually go to this healthcare center. And you know what's worse? When these elderly people reach to the, to the end of their life, they cannot die in dignity. They have to go to the emergency room, receive re resuscitation because they don't have a consent form there. And someone will jump on them and, 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 and press on their chest. And then even if they end up in a hospital, they're usually not adequately looked after because all the focus of the personnel in the acute care hospital will go to those patients with acute problem. And elderly people are left on the bed, you know, with very little attention, and especially with a shortage of nursing staff. So I hope, you know, uh, when we have this opportunity here with this conference, people in Hong Kong, the, those decision makers, especially the people from the public health department who left early, <laughs> looking after primary care, they should really, you know, come to their senses. Thank you. Uh, I don't think there's anyone to respond, but, but I just, I think Professor Campbell uh, talked about uh, Singapore. Uh, in fact, when I, we, we did the comparative study uh, funded by the NUS on comparative studies of health systems between Malaysia, Singapore, and Hong Kong, I think these three places were historically colonial systems. And I think when you look at the Sri Lanka, it's the same. Uh, the, when the colonial government started health services, they started it with mainly provision for the expatriate population and for the military. And then the local population, the philanthropists, uh, the, uh, uh, the missionaries then started hospitals for the local population. And when the systems developed, obviously the pressure, originally they started with uh, primary care clinics. And then, but the, as the pressure on, for resources uh, uh, came in and becomes became more affluent, they felt that in those governments, they felt that the primary care was affordable. So then primary care then became a service for the poor uh, in the public sector. And then because people couldn't afford hospital care, so the governments uh, in all those jurisdictions, in, in colonial governments, built hospitals. And that's the legacy. So when you look at, at, at systems, I think there, there are many, the systems aren't, cannot be created uh, out, out of nothing. They, there's a historical part dependency. So when you, when you study policy, you understand some of those things. And there are only two ways that you can have a, a comprehensive system for healthcare. One is tax-based and second is social insurance. So we decided not to go to social insurance. And we also don't want to nationalize everything. So you have a choice. So you can, you can tell the secretary uh, whether you want to put more money into health and then bring in the, the private sector, do primary care. That's one way of doing it. Or the other way is to have a social insurance system. 
so I think this is what, the, so when you talk about the issues, one needs to understand what the solutions are and what are the options and whether it's something that's feasible uh, for the place. And I think those are things that, uh, I think the, the, the policies, the ethics, the values come in. And I think when you look at health systems, uh, it's, it's very much value driven by any societies. I think some, earlier we had some discussions about some of the values that are not expressed, but there are intrinsic in some decisions that you make. And I think in policy, in Hong Kong, because uh, I think you some mentioned about capitalism, uh, because we are very much driven by our economy. So that is something that the government has always uh, used as a principle. So it pervades all the policy decisions. So many of the policies in one sector are not policies that are driven purely by that sector. And I think they, they are influenced by the, the policies in the, uh, the values in the policy sector. Uh, uh, Dr. Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. J. I'm a pediatrician. I happen to be the immediate past president of the Hong Kong Medical Association. So Dr. Xi is, is my successor. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I come here to attend this conference because I'm also uh, the chairman of the Ethics Committee of the Medical Council of Hong Kong. So this is about ethical issue. Um, I tend to echo that we do not have a well-developed primary care system in Hong Kong, but we have a lot of primary care doctors. I'm a primary care doctor. I'm a specialist in pediatrics, but I provide primary care for pediatric patients. We don't have a good system. Yes, we have a very good system of secondary care and tertiary care and the hospital authority but we do have a well-developed primary care system. We have a group, a large group of primary care doctors, which is purely market-driven, because we are all providing service in, in the private sector. That's why we are market-driven. The resources for primary care are in the pockets of individual citizens. They have the choice to select whether they, are, they want to have primary care or whether they want to have secondary care. This is the reality. So how are we going to tackle this problem of primary care? I think it, it is the role of the government to develop a system so that they can make better use of the primary care doctors in Hong Kong. How are they going to do that? They have injected the, most of the resources into the hospital authority concentrating on providing secondary and tertiary care. I think it is about time that the government is going to take a good look at the hospital authority, whether some of the services they are providing in the hospital authority can be allocated for primary care, like what Dr. Xi has just mentioned about the care of the uh, elderly patients in elderly patients in the OH homes, because we see it from the demographic study provided by Professor Yip that we are facing an aging population. If we all concentrate on the health care provision from the hospital authority in the hospital base, then our resources is going to be exhausted. The, the, the demand for health care is, is unlimited, so we cannot afford that. So I think this is about time that we should take a good look at the services provided by the hospital authority, whether we can make better use of our primary care providers in Hong Kong. We are not lack of primary care providers in Hong Kong, but they are in the market. Thank you. Okay. Uh, maybe you can move on to another topic. I think uh, to, because I think we we don't want to um, just talk about the issues in Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Liu. I have a question. To, uh, directed at the panel. I like what E.K. was saying. Uh, if uh, we're to do something um, to improve our health, we need to understand where the problems are, what the problems are. Uh, I heard the number of solutions or proposed suggestions how we deal with the uh, improvements in Hong Kong. Uh, I, I, I'm pass, you know, puzzled by the, uh, the, the word aging in many ways. I thought I understood it, and I thought I understood what aging implications would be. Uh, 40 years ago, or more than 40 years ago, I had the, uh, the exposure to what dependency ratios are. And uh, same definitions apply. 
Now, uh, but I, I think what uh, Louis was saying also was that we have to change the way we look at things, change the way we do things. By definition or by census, I'm an elderly. Uh, the only thing that I can feel that I'm an elderly is when I take the public transportation is that I only pay two dollars. <laughs> but I, I don't have anybody in the public transportation that would give up their seat for me, even if they were sitting in the seats um, that were designated for the elderly, and they were much younger than me. So I, I'd like to ask the question, really, uh, how do we define aging? And who is an elderly? <laughs> Anyone and, older than you are. <laughs> <laughs> but more importantly, we also heard about providing services for the dying and also the... Um, when does dying start? How do we define dying? So those two questions. I thought if we have clarity in those areas, we can probably better define what services we need. Nobody listened to me. You know, when, when they talk about elderly care, sorry, Elvin. Uh, what services would I like to have or not want to have? Do I want to go see a primary care doctor in the context of Hong Kong or do a, an experienced professional who can take care of my problems at my age bracket? I talk to my cohorts. We feel very differently than our previous generations uh, of elderly. Okay. So I'd like to hear some comments from you so in terms of the definition. You want to deal with one and then Michael the other? Thank you. One on aging and one on dying. <laughs> Paul, do you want to start? Which one do you want? To well, I, I always said, uh, because we are the, I'm the director for the Center for Suicide Research and Prevention. I thought everyone is going to die, so don't jump the queue, OK? <laughs> <laughs> you have your time. <laughs> um, so I think when we talk about dying, I think, I think yeah, it is inevitable. We always, there's a Chinese saying that if we, if there's no dying, I mean, then we do not know how to live, isn't it? So, 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 so that, that's always that's a, that's a thing. So I always say that I, uh, I'm not a philosopher. I'm sure there's some, some philosopher will give you a better answer. But what I can say that I think uh, I'm grateful uh, to have a healthy, uh, uh, have a healthy life so far. Touch wood. And so I think what we should do, I think in Hong Kong, I think we should spend more money, I think on the prevention side, I think is to keep these people healthy and such that I think um, uh, 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 we all can have a meaningful life, I think uh, up to the right to the very end. Sometimes I think we, we earn our wealth, uh, we, earn our, we, we earn our wealth and lose our health at young age and at the old age, I think we spend our wealth to try to earn our health. And at the end, both sides, we are not happy. So why don't we just relax a bit and we have a family-friendly working policy in place, don't work too hard, and then try to not to have the conference that early in the morning and everybody can have a good time. And I think that's how I see it. Okay. Michael, do you want to add on? Sure. When, whenever I'm confronted with this, I always turn to my favorite philosopher, uh, Bob Dylan, um, who who explained that those not busy being born are busy dying. So, uh, you know, I have a fairly broad uh, understanding of this, but, but in a more serious way, one of the things that we've been talking about with researchers at CUHK in thinking about dying is to, is to really think very carefully about different trajectories. Uh, depending on on the disease, and so so dying has has different meaning uh, uh, depending on, on what you're dying from. Um, and again, I think this comes. So many of these things keep coming back to uh, sort of a deep exploration of what you're trying to achieve with health and social policy, what your goals are, and what the evolving goals uh, ought to be uh, in response to changing needs. Uh, and that that can't be driven by data, but, but it can be informed by data about what's happening within the systems. Um, so I do think, uh, going back to the previous discussion, it is important to be sort of sensitive to where these systems came from. And I'm also sensitive coming from the United States of criticizing anyone's health system, which I find deeply ironic, um, since we would love to have your hospital system in many ways. Um, but it is useful, I think, for these cross-national comparisons not to try to just sort of pick up solutions and move them to a place that has a long history, but to reflect on the underlying principles that are adopted in terms of what's working and what isn't working. Uh, my colleagues 
colleague Joe White likes to refer to the international standard in healthcare. Lots of things in health policy are, are extraordinarily complex. Uh, the big picture really isn't. It's fairly simple. You just cover everybody and use a budget um, in order to solve most problems. Uh, and the other sort of quip that I like that I think relates back to your concern about interest groups um, is comes from Uwe Reinhardt, uh, the great uh, economist at Princeton University who once recognized that every dollar in healthcare spending is a dollar in healthcare income. And we should recognize that that's an important factor and it's going to continue to be a barrier. But I think where ethics can play an important role is continuing, continually forcing us to ask better questions about what we want to achieve uh, and pointing out where there is a gap between what we're doing and what we want to do in terms of our health systems. I think that's the best we can do, but, uh, but I think it's a valuable role to play. I, I've been told that we don't have time, but uh, Derek, you, you want to make a quick comment and a question? So we have the last uh, comment or question. Yes, uh, Derek now from Hospital Authority. Um, I, I, I'm not about to get into a response to uh, uh, Dr. Shea, we're good friends, so we don't want to unfriend, unfriend each other. Uh, after this uh, convention. Uh, but uh, really, I think on the issue of primary care versus hospital care, I think it's a bit risky to polarize the two as um, something that's antagonistic to each other. Uh, I think the challenge of Hong Kong is really that we haven't been able to jumpstart primary care to be effective on two things. One is on gatekeeping uh, patients. It's, we're not talking about general health screenings or primary care. We're talking about gatekeeping for hospital care. And the other thing we haven't been able to do and not just for primary care, is to develop some sort of hospital care at home kind of concept to take care of ill patients at home with the appropriate uh, setup. I think really those two should be the focus for the future uh, policy setting in Hong Kong, regardless whether we're from primary or, or uh, hospital sectors. Uh, I, I think uh, we can work on a number of fronts on those two issues in the future. Yeah. Okay, I think because we, we uh, have got to pass the this uh, podium on to the next session. So to thank our speakers for uh, their uh, for their very stimulating uh, presentations and for you for participating. I think the rest of the sessions will carry on because the impacts of uh, the aging and chronic diseases, the ethical issues, the transition of care. I think those are all going to be covered late in the day. And then also there's a session on on uh, who's going to pay for the elders. So the financial issues are also going to be dealt with. So some of the things that you want to raise will probably be better answered in those, those areas. And, and I think end of life care is something that uh, obviously government is also looking at. Uh, we, are doing a, we are going to do a study for the government and may, maybe after that we can answer some of the questions that have been asked. Okay, thank you very much.